Good afternoon. I just want to remind our, our guests, our attendants, that the, uh, there are plenty of seats down here. If you can please get seated, we can get started. Uh, lots of uh, seats in the front of the church here. I want to thank you folks for coming out on this rainy day uh, way out here. This is a this is great turnout and so pleased to see you. Uh, my name is Chuck West and I am a former professor, whoops, <laughs> I'm a former professor at the University of Arkansas in the Crop, Soil and Environmental Sciences Department. I am now at Texas Tech University but I maintain my ties here and it was, um, but before I introduce our speaker, I, there's a couple of uh, uh, notices that I, I want to share with you. And that is that there are two more sustainability themed lectures that are coming up this week on campus. Okay, two more this week. So this is just the beginning of a, of a big watershed of sustainability lectures. Uh, the first one is going to be tomorrow at 5.30. And that is going to be by Marcus Erickson, co-founder and executive director of the, of the five Jeers, Jeers, Five Jeers Institute will speak at, uh, at 5.30 right here in Giffel's Auditorium on saving our seas, the perils of plastic pollution in the marine, e marine environment. Sponsors of the talk are the Parks Family Professorship in Science Education, the Center for Agricultural and Rural Sustainability, and the Associated Student Government. After that, on the next day, on Thursday at 3 o'clock, okay, Thursday at 3 o'clock, there is the Pulitzer Prize winning editorial writer, Thomas Hilton, author of Saving Our Land, sorry, Save Our Land, Save Our Towns. And we'll build, speak on building sustainable communities. This will take place at 3 o'clock Thursday in the Walton College of Business in room 203 of the Willard Walker Hall. His talk is sponsored by the Applied Sustainability Center and Associated Student Government. And so uh, please look forward to those two coming up tomorrow and Thursday. <clears throat> so here we are uh, for our featured speaker and it's great pleasure for me uh, to introduce him. Um, I also want to recognize uh, Dr. Julie Carrier, um, my colleague, uh, professor in the Biological and Agricultural Engineering Department, because it was about a year ago that we responded to a, to a call for proposals uh, for speakers for the Winthrop Rockefeller Distinguished Lecture Series. Now both of us have had uh, contacts with uh, Dr. Lind, our speaker, and, um, and we thought that this would be a very good tie-in because it, because it uh, describes agriculture but in a much broader sense in, on a global um, level and how it is, interacts with some very key issues in uh, sustainability uh, energy, uh, poverty, population, and all those get, can be uh, tied together. Well, Dr. Lee Lind is the Paul E. and Joan H. Keno Distinguished Professor in Environmental Engineering Design in the Thayer School of Engineering at Dartmouth College. He is also an adjunct professor of biological sciences at the same university. He is a professor extraordinary of microbiology at Stellenbosch University, South Africa. And also in his spare time, he is director and chief scientific officer of Mescoma Corporation. Now, he has a very long list uh, of things that he's accomplished. I'm not going to go through that. You can just uh, be assured he has uh, tremendous productivity. His interests are the technology for the production of energy from cellulosic biomass, transition paths to a sustainable world, metabolic engineering, and several other things, too. So that goes on and on. But anyway, Julie and I have been very impressed with his insightful analysis of global issues and how it ties together these key issues of sustainability, food, energy, and so on. And also, we are impressed with his penchant for lively discussion, and you'll see that today. It is with that that I uh, invite you to uh, welcome uh, Professor Lee Lind as our speaker today. Thank you, Chuck. Okay, well, thank you, Chuck and Julie and uh, all the people who've welcomed me warmly. Uh, it's an honor to be here. I, I've never uh, been to Arkansas or Fayetteville before, and uh, 
as far as I can tell, you have a, a precious corner of the world, and um, it, it's great to come into your circle for a day. So I'm going to be uh, presenting some, quite a few results that are not yet published. They may change a bit before they're published, but I wouldn't present them if I didn't think that I know what direction they're going. And so while that introduces a bit of uncertainty from your point of view, uh, it also probably increases the chance that you'll hear things you haven't heard before. So uh, since I've got a heaping helping of slides, and I don't want to keep you too long, I better get on with it. Um, twice in history, uh, major changes in the resources used by humanity have transformed day-to-day -day life and societal organization. The Neolithic or agricultural revolution marked the transition from most people supporting themselves with hunting and gathering to pre-industrial agriculture. And the industrial revolution marked the transition between pre-industrial agriculture and the current system we're in, a pre-sustainable industrial reality. We had about 50 million people on the earth in the first transition, about 750 million the second time. Maybe there's a rule that every time the Earth's population increases by roughly an order of magnitude, you have another one of these. And the scale of societal integration and, uh, was much more modest. There were many parallel human experiments as opposed, as opposed to one globally linked human experiment. Today, there are abundant indications that a third revolution is required. I call it the sustainability revolution, or if you prefer, sustainability transition. This is, needs to be underway, and there are signs it's underway now. We now have about 7 billion people. We have perhaps a century to get this done. And as I mentioned, we live in a global world. So relative to these earlier transitions, we've got more people, less time, and I think at some level higher risk. And I see this as the defining challenge of our time. And frankly, and I really mean this, it's been really gratifying to me to meet so many young people who are very oriented and sensitized and ready to move into action on this challenge. So uh, you're, you're giving me great hope. And, you know, whether oil lasts another 50 years or uh, less, if you take a step back, the trajectory of petroleum use is going to look something like this. The trajectory of population uh, growth already is the solid blue line and hopefully will level off. There are two parts of that hope. One is that it won't continue to rise, which there are some indications that that's the case. The other is, though, that there won't be catastrophic falls. And then, in addition, we've got atmospheric CO2 uh, going through the roof, metaphorically speaking. And these changes are happening faster and faster. So part of this situation is, of course, the food challenge. I'm going to be talking to you about land. And I think it's good to start with when you're talking about land with food, both because it's so important and it's where most people begin. There are many statements, I won't read them to you, to the effect that this is by itself a very pressing and challenging matter. I, we may discuss it in the q and A. I'm, I'm not sure I think it's quite as uh, a matter of threading the needle as some other people do, frankly, but certainly uh, something we need to be paying a great deal of attention to. There is widespread consensus on this, that the fundamental approach the world needs to take in thinking about increasing, uh, feeding an increasing population with increasing demands for where they eat on the food chain is through sustainable intensification and not primarily through expanding managed lands to places that are not now managed. There simply isn't that much of that land, and there tend to be fairly severe prices in terms of stored carbon and or habitat loss uh, in, in moving out of currently managed lands. So broad consensus, actually. I, I know a few people, and I travel fairly widely in these circles that take exception to this, that basically we need to get more out of the land that we're already managing. And so it's interesting because in the time I've been in this field, there was a time that the notion of putting sustainability and intensification next to each other were regarded as an oxymoron, but that's not true anymore uh, and hasn't been for some time. Here's an early reference to this term, sustainable intensification of agriculture, very prominent report by the Royal Society, science and the sustainable intensification of global agriculture, 
more locally in the East African highlands, talking about it uh, in a particular part of Argentina, this prominent paper by David Tillman on global food demand and the sustainable intensification of agriculture. So this is what the food system needs to do, and clearly there are grave consequences uh, to failure at this, especially for the world's poor. And what I'm going to show you here is an animation. So green is land that's fully occupied by natural uh, vegetation. And as you go towards yellow and orange, it's land that is, um, has a small fraction of natural vegetation. And this starts 8,000 years before the present. And I want you to notice how fast things accelerate near the end of this period. And I'll try, last 20 seconds, I'll try to just call out places. So look at the Fertile Crescent up above Saudi Arabia. Look at uh, near the Andes. Look at India. Look at China. Look at Mexico, Northern Africa, Europe. We still have 1,500 years before the present. China filling out. Uh, Sub-Saharan Africa. Europe's pretty full, 300 years. Watch North America, bang. OK, so the, we're changing fast, as I mentioned. And um, the places in the world that can grow things are rather fully occupied. That's not the same as saying they're rather fully utilized, however. Well, we also, of course, have the sustainable energy challenge. And a smooth transition to a world supported by sustainable energy sources is also a great challenge. I don't know that we need to compare these in a competitive way, but we certainly need to pay attention to this one, too. So again, we've gone from a hunting and gathering to a uh, agrarian to an industrial to sort of the information age. And if the future involves you know, a several fold reduction in the human population, that is not going to be a fun place to be. And clearly, our current population levels are supported by the very high level of energy services that much of the world has come to enjoy and virtually all the world aspires to. And so here's one indication in a similar format of the energy challenge, or excuse me, an aspect of it. This is compiled uh, by NASA, and it has to do with the deviation from a uh, reference period, that is 1951, whoa, 1951 to 1980. So blue is below that, and yellow and orange is getting above it. And it gives you a sense of the dynamic climate. There were some cool periods, some warmer periods, more or less steady, until you get to roughly the 1990s, and then you will notice a pronounced increase in orange and red. So there we are in 2009, and particularly uh, near the poles, which we've, uh, there has been very uh, great uh, ice melting observed, uh, especially at the northern pole. So. Within the energy challenge, bioenergy, of course, with, by which I mean uh, energy made from uh, products of photosynthesis. I focus primarily on products of photosynthesis you can't eat, but bioenergy does include uh, a broader category than that. Within the energy nexus, I would like to ask with you or offer answers to the question, is this discretionary or obligatory? And I frame this question in terms of the International Energy Agency technology perspectives published in June of last year. And for the first time in their most recent version of this uh, report, they look at the various temp uh, energy futures in terms of various uh, increases in the global mean temperature. So they have a six degree scenario, a four degree scenario, and a two degree scenario. The six degree scenario is an extension of current policies, or their best estimate of that. This is by 2050, these temperature increases. The four degree scenario assumes the adoption of a range of policies that are currently under consideration but not yet adopted by the world's government. The two degree scenario, they tell me, is about as little as they can imagine. It involves very aggressive messages to uh, avoid energy use by increasing efficiency, to shift from higher emission modes to lower emission modes, and to accelerate the development and deployment of advanced low carbon technologies. And just to give the frame of reference, the difference between today's mean global temperature and that in the last ice age was 5.6 degrees centigrade. Chicago was under a mile of ice at that time. And so one definitely would have noticed uh, the difference. So these temperature differences can have a big impact. So here's a busy slide. This is looking specifically at transportation. 
It looks at multiple modes of transportation, personal light duty vehicles, bus, rail, and then also moving freight around through air, uh, road, rail, and water. And so I want to make just a few points on this, lots of colors. And the maroon and red refer to electricity and hydrogen. And I think there is, in some parts, uh, including some statements made by our former Secretary of Energy, kind of the idea that um, we really could electrify everything and uh, perhaps not need bioenergy or biofuels in this particular case. So a couple of things I'd like to point out. Uh, let's look at the big ones here, light duty vehicles, shown to decline in this scenario with increasing public transportation and increasing efficiency. This is energy use, so it's not miles driven. Um, Air, aviation is a big one. Road freight is a big one. I think the one that surprised me the most on this is water transport, which is bigger than aviation now and expected to stay that way all the way through 2075. But I want to point out the very large contribution by 2075 of hydrogen and electricity, these low carbon options other than biofuels. 80% of light duty vehicles, 70% of buses, 100% of rail, 50% of road freight. So if you're an advocate for those technologies or an optimist or, or whatnot, they're certainly playing a large role. However, if you add all of these up and you look at 2075, by which time there's been a great deal of time to go through kinetic, uh, through rate processes, in round numbers, about half of the overall transportation sector is provided for by hydrogen and batteries together. And roughly the other half is provided by biofuels. And the reason for that is that it's very difficult to, for these, the longer you go, the more the penalty of not using liquid hydrocarbons for energy storage uh, comes to hurt. And so, and I point out that, that not only the International Energy Agency, but the Global Energy Assessment also puts uh, roughly this role for bioenergy, about a quarter of primary energy supply. There's 50 exajoules, maybe not a familiar unit, uh, fix 50 exajoules of bioenergy in this scenario of biofuels. That is about equal to the energy that is released annually due to human-induced fires uh, on the planet, and uh, not a particularly hard one uh, to meet. Notice the little stars here. Let's see if I can get a pointer going. Uh, hmm. Might have test driven that. That's OK. The little stars there with the dotted lines are the total allowable emissions in the two degree scenario. And so if you were not to use biofuels, the allowable emissions for a two degree result would be exceeded. So my feeling is that in a carbon unconstrained future, you can make an argument that biofuels are discretionary. I focus on biofuels here because I think they have the strongest argument that we can't do without them in a sustainable world. But in a carbon constrained world, if you believe as I do that that's where we need to be heading, I think biofuels are likely obligatory or to put it differently, it's extremely risky to plan without them. So as some of you may know, I spend an awful lot of time in various contexts looking at so-called second generation uh, biofuels, that is, produced from cellulosic biomass, plants you can't eat. I'm going to show one and only one slide on those today. I'm sorry if that's what you came to hear about, but uh, I can only put so much uh, into the time. But for all sorts of reasons, um, cellulosic biomass uh, has potential to produce more energy per hectare and does indeed produce more energy, more photosynthetic energy per hectare than other kinds of terrestrial systems. We can talk about algae, which can produce even more energy per hectare, if you like, uh, in the q and I'm not going to say more about it now. Uh, also, there are uh, great potential environmental benefits, as well as some environmental matters one needs to pay close attention to, to using cellulosic biomass, including uh, the potential for essentially a zero emission, zero net greenhouse gas emission cycle and the potential to improve soil and water quality and indeed store carbon. I'll be talking about some of those. But at the level of 50 exajoules, it's very unlikely that the world can, um, can provide that kind of energy, uh, that quantity of energy as biofuels without second generation biofuels. I think there's broad consensus on that point. And the other thing is that in the range of 40 to $80 per dry ton, 
That's about two and a half to a little over five dollars per gigajoule. And that corresponds to oil at 15 to 30 dollars a barrel. I'm talking about the purchase price of biomass compared to the purchase price of oil. Today, second generation biofuels can't compete economically because they're still too expensive to produce the processes, but there's lots of reasons to think that those processes can come down in time. So I'm optimistic that they can compete and they are necessary in order to uh, provide for the kind of futures that I will be talking about. So you've got the food challenge and I would argue a need for bioenergy and particularly biofuels and this leads to a sustainable land use challenge. Now sustainable land use is a challenge without bioenergy. When you add bioenergy to those already substantial issues, you have more complexity, you have more challenges, but I think overlooked, you also have more opportunities. And that's one of the points I hope you take away from this talk. So in terms of how we can think about navigating to a sustainable world, and in my view, this applies to all resources and all sectors, perhaps most obvious but most often overlooked we need to be prepared to do things differently than we do them now. I can't tell you how many times I have seen people do analyses which essentially extrapolate the present and then somehow express surprise or chagrin that you don't get to a result that's particularly different than uh, the way we already do things. A systemic approach is absolutely necessary where multiply, multiple mutually reinforcing approaches are used to achieve multiple mutually reinforcing objectives there are things that can be very heavy lifters in a sustainable future. So it's possible to say, it's popular to say there are no silver bullets. Well, okay, there's no silver bullets, but there might be some bronze ones. I mean, there's some very, very important technologies, but you don't just implement them in isolation. There needs to be a lot of complementarity and systemic approaches. And finally, increased efficiency all along the supply chain is absolutely essential. Another one of the points I hope you remember, and it's really the organizing principle for the rest of the talk. I think we need to think about land more similarly to how we think about energy. When we think about energy, I think most people, the possible exception of Dick Cheney, um, recognize that, that energy efficiency has really got to be part of the future. And integrated production, com combined heat and power, uh, elect uh, ethanol and electricity, widely done in Brazil. And then finally, a role for the consumer. I think we recognize that, you know, the, the cars we buy and how well we, you know, double-paned windows and all the rest of it is part of the equation. It's not something that can be done for us. It's something we partly have to do for ourselves. And with some exceptions, but I think it's generally true, very few of those things are characteristic of the way people think about land. So I want to talk about these with you. I want to start talking about some very new and I think exciting work on the idea of land efficiency. So just to make the point, we've been thinking about energy efficiency for a long time. Amory Levins in 1990 talked about the megawatt revolution. Barack Obama announced these very aggressive vehicle standards. Public awareness is widespread. For land efficiency, there are few countries that have policies that are aimed at promoting land efficient food production and consumption, and actually there's been scant motivation, at least in the EU and in the um, United States for the last century, although not now in particular, crop prices in general have been low, and if you went to an agricultural policymaker and said, let's work on land efficiency, he'd say, well, now let's see. This is going to mean fewer acres being planted, and my big challenge is keeping farmers and farm economies and community on the acres that we have. So it didn't meet with a very receptive audience. These things are changing, however. So forgive me for being a little bit analytical and mathematical for a bit, but I'm also going to be very visual. And, and, and when we think about land utilization and intensification, just getting more out of land, the approach is very well established for row crops. Indeed, at the University of Minnesota, and there are other people who've looked at this, they've got so-called yield gap analyses for 173 different row crops. That's more than I knew there were. And their approach is based on this idea of climate binning. So they're going to bin land that has similar properties, for example, with respect to precipitation and degree days. 
and inventory current production in each bin from low to high. These bins are distributed all over the world, so you're not taking a given geographic area, you're taking a given area with a, with a, a similar set of properties. And the premise is that yields within a bin, yield variation within a bin, is attributable to factors other than climate, because you form the bin by assembling land with similar climate, and notably give a good, at least initial, indication of differences with respect to management that can then be further interrogated. So I'm going to talk about the yield, the, the 90th or 95th percentile yield, a crude and imperfect measure, perhaps, of potential, but an easily understood one, a place to start. So we'll refer to that as Y90 or Y95. And the actual yield would be Y sub A. The yield gap is the difference between what could be and what is, subtraction. And the intensification potential is the ratio of what could be to what is. So you could say, look, you know, in a given uh, crop, that crop could, if all land in the world achieved, let's say, the 90th percentile, perhaps produce twice as much, because most of the world actually, in that climate bin with similar conditions, has less than the 90th percentile by definition. This has not been previously reported by, for pasture and livestock, however, and as I'll show you, most of the land that humans uh, manage in the world is pasture land. So here's the way this looks visually, and this is a picture that, that, that I'm really pretty optimistic may be very useful. So the area under this curve, the area in brown, is proportional to the actual uh, production. The vertical axis is yield, for example, units per hectare, and the horizontal axis is land. And so we've got one end of that curve within a, within a given climate bin, we've got the low productivity land, low yielding land. At the other end of the curve, we've got the high yielding land, and all in proportion to the area occupied by different yield. So the area under the curve is proportional to what we produce now. The cross-hatched area is proportional to, in this case, the 95th percentile yield. So, if there's a lot of area above the curve, that means there's a lot of unused potential. All right, and in this case, actually, for this particular visual example, the intensification ratio, if all the world performed at the 95th percentile that the world currently realizes, divided by actual performance, would be about six. It would say if we had this shaped curve, we could produce six times more of that crop than we do now on the land that crop now occupies. So here's what it looks like for corn. First of all, you can see the climate bins. So the vertical axis is precipitation. The horizontal axis and the inset is temperature, basically, in degree days. So as you go up in precipitation, the colors get darker. And as you go right in temperature, the colors go from cold to hot, from blue to red. And so we divide the world into 100 climate bins. And then for each of those climate bins, individually, we plot from the lowest yield to the highest yield, you get this shape. And you see there's not that much unused area. Uh, it's roughly half. And so, in fact, a little more than half of this area is occupied. So at the 90th percentile level, if the whole world reached that performance level, the maize productivity would be, we could produce one and a half times more maize than we do now on land we now plant in maize. And at the 95th percentile, it would be about 1.7. Now, corn breeders are working on raising that highest percentile, and it has raised in over the last decades. So that's, that's maize. What about applying this, though, to pasture? So the one and only inventory of the world's livestock population is the Gridded Livestock Study. Ram and Cuddy et al. came up with a land classification scheme, and we cut it off to uh, land that has three or less animal units per hectare um, so that we don't get into higher productivity systems than pasture, for example, mixed crop and livestock systems, which are very important. And you can climate bin the world's pasture land. And a lot of numbers here, and I, but I, I've learned a lot from this graph. So first of all, you can talk about where the livestock are. And I always assumed, frankly, that uh, most of the world's livestock, I think of the United States as you go out west, lots of cattle. Uh, so I assumed most of the world's livestock were growing on land that uh, is, was hot and dry. Actually, most of the world's livestock grow on land that's cool and wet. As you can see from this left-hand one, the highest numbers are in the upper left-hand corner. Um, so that was a surprise. 
The average stocking density is 0.35 animal units, that's a cattle equivalent uh, animal unit, per hectare, which is very, very low. And perhaps the biggest surprise, if we take land that is classified as pasture, which is a land cover rather than a land use characterization, only 40% of it is actually, uh, 60, excuse me, 60% of it is occupied by domestic animals and 40% is not. So here is, I think for the first time, a pasture yield curve looking at the world's binned pastures and we find that at the 90th percentile, and this does not include the 40% of unoccupied land, by the way, nor does it include different pasture management systems, some of which are inherently more productive than others, but for pasture land, the 90th percentile is about a 2.2-fold increase in productivity, the 95th percentile about a three-fold increase. And so you might say, well, show me an example where this has happened. Uh, thank you for the question. In Brazil, uh, between 1985 and 2006, pasture area actually went down, but the production of beef uh, tripled and therefore the yield more than tripled in 20 years. There's lots more to do. What's the impact of management variables, sustainability evaluation, local analysis, and examples? But it's interesting to look at where the, what the world's land profile looks like. About 42% of the world is dominated by humans, Another 29% is natural forest and woodland, and most of the rest is desert. If we look at the 42% that's dominated by humans, 61% of that is pasture, 29% is cropland, 6% is managed forestry. Now remember, I started earlier talking about bioenergy, and you might think amongst these land categories, where is it logical to look to the bioenergy to come from? Well, in the case of cropland, there's a very strong competing priority, which is food production, we get much less food value out of pasture land globally than we do uh, cropland, especially considering all the animals that are actually fed from cropland. Um, natural forest and woodland also has strong competing priorities of habitat preservation and avoiding large carbon debts. Neither of these is uh, off the table as a concern for pasture, but it's much less of a concern. The intensification potential of pasture, I think, is very likely, although it's only starting to be analyzed, much larger than uh, cropland. So in light of the large land base, the intensification potential, and the fact that the biomass, that pasture land and grasslands are nature's annually harvestable biomass. And that is an advantage from the point of view of uh, carbon debts and the like. So, I think that pasture, uh, given all of these considerations, is the most logical place to look to produce bioenergy. And it's interesting that the critical assessments of bioenergy and land consequences are almost exclusively focused on either competition with cropland or consequences of forest, defor uh, forest clearing and are not in general focused on, uh, on land uh, that's pasture. And so what might we do with this? Well, we can combine climate binning analysis with a global energy crop model to project productivities on this land that might be available and improve databases because they have some serious deficiencies now on land cover and livestock and ask questions like, for example, what fraction of the world's unoccupied pastures would be necessary to produce in bioenergy crops in order to meet uh, an amount of energy corresponding to current liquid petroleum? I don't know the answer to that question, but I hope you'll agree it's an interesting one. With this climate explicit approach, one can also layer on effects of climate change and see what that happens, see what that does to it all. And so a brief comment about something I and others are thinking about a lot these days, which is, well, what about the food insecure poor? Uh, Jeremy Woods and I wrote in 2011, we began our paper by saying, it has widely been assumed that increased production of energy from biomass requires a sacrifice in food security, especially for the world's poor, yet closer scrutiny suggests that modern bioenergy in the form of fuel, electricity, or heat could be developed in ways that increase food security. Consideration of the impact of bioenergy on African food security has tended to focus on land competition and to overlook bioenergy's marked potential to promote rural development. However, Potentially productive land is rather plentiful in Africa. Indeed, Africa has more arable land than any other continent, whereas 
much of uh, Africa lacks, uh, excuse me, is rather plentiful in much of Africa, whereas lack of development is by far the most important underlying uh, cause of hunger. And August Temu from the World Agroforestry Center made the following, I think, salient observation. Africa has 12 times the land of India and area, 30% fewer people and similar land quality, and yet India, in composite, maybe not locally, but in composite, produces enough food to feed itself, and Africa doesn't come close. And the reasons for that have nothing to do with geographical limited limitations, but rather the failure of human institutions, and indeed several of them. So what seems to me particularly interesting in a developing country context is to say, look, Let's start for what is, with what is, in terms of climate and soil and land use and cover and current yields, but also social status and needs and land ownership. And let's talk about what yields could be uh, and how energy could be incorporated and what kinds of scenarios, it's clear that this physical potential exists to produce more food, more energy, improve fertility, cleaner water and air, and then ask, so what needs to happen to realize these potentials? and ultimately deliver uh, human benefits in terms of economic development. These need to be distributed benefits, not just to a few, and higher quality of life. I think there's great potential to look at this sort of thing. So a bit about integrated production. Remember I mentioned these three things, these ways we think about energy. We need to think more about land in these ways. So in specialized agriculture, we have inputs going into crop production. We produce food and feed. And on a mass basis, when we grow grain, typically there's on the order of one dry unit of matter of agricultural residue per unit of actual grain. So that arrow, that brown arrow there, is roughly proportional. And in parallel with that, in many parts of the world, we've got livestock, where we've got external inputs. Anybody who has been around livestock knows that the animal waste uh, arrow actually exceeds the output. My son runs a dairy farm. It's mostly about manure management. Um, uh, so this is the specialized agriculture model, which is fairly familiar to us in the United States, but I think there may be some things on this slide that are surprising to you. Well, it's just about stating the obvious, and this does happen in all parts of the world, including in the United States, maybe not to the extent it could, but in fact not to the extent it could in many places. But you know what, the residue from crops are of value to the animal production enterprise, and the residues from animal production are valuable to the crop production enterprise. So in a more integrated or mixed system, one can imagine smaller external inputs. And so here we have on the left a feedlot next to a cornfield, at least physically separated, and on the right we've got uh, cows uh, grazing on the stubble left after the corn is harvested. And a uh, quote from a prominent review in this, compared to specialized systems, mixed crop and livestock systems allow more efficient use of resources, spreading of risks, and lessen the impact of the environment, on the environment. Now here's maybe some of the surprises. 50% of the world's food production is produced in this mixed mode and 70% of the world's people are fed in land managed in this mixed mode, and yet many of the policies and initiatives that are aimed at combating world hunger tend to focus on the more specialized mode and increasing their yields. And in particular, the mixed mode is predominant in areas where most of the population growth in the future will occur. And so uh, from that same review, although I've added some things here so they I don't want to put all of this in their mouth. Um, but they talk about this progression from expansive agriculture with sort of slash and burn with long fallow periods to low external input agriculture, often with extensive integration, to a high external input and often specialized agriculture, which much of the world, the developed world, is doing now, to what they call a new conservation agriculture that is ex has extensive integration and is knowledge intensive. And so the general progression is that productivity gets high. We might hope to maintain and perhaps enhance, but we'd be doing pretty well to maintain productivity in new conservation agriculture. We're going to have to apply at least as much knowledge and likely somewhat more as we close some of these cycles in this more integrated system. But it's interesting some other trends have a zigzag pattern. So the labor intensity 
would go up with low external input, would go down with high external input, and then would go up again with new conservation. And in terms of the extent of integrated resource management, again, higher, lower, and then higher, which suggests for the, that for the world that's in the low external input, often integrated mode now, they may do very well to look to try to progress directly to a new conservation mode rather than going through a specialized phase because there are fewer discontinuities to that path. And then finally, scale, which also the, the integration is, it's not that, 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 that large farms are necessarily a bad idea, but in general, resource integration is easier to achieve on a somewhat smaller scale. So, Extractive land management has left behind degraded land in many, many parts of the world. This picture is from Brazil and it shows the downhill slide uh, for pasture land. But conservation agriculture com with integrated crop and livestock systems, and of course they've got an acronym for it, has actually reversed this trend to a very significant degree. So this is an example where integrated management of, of pasture and uh, crops uh, has very positive impacts and I'm not going to read through these 22 factors all of which are benefits and by the way this study by Landers from the FAO I can give you the full citation if anyone's interested it is absolutely a labor of love by this guy it's this hundred page book very comprehensive many examples done over a 20 year period but the point I want to make is that these benefits accrue both to economics to yield and to measures of environmental quality I think we easily start to assume that it's all a matter of trade-offs and you can't escape trade-offs, but I think there are many opportunities in the world where all metrics can, can get better and we certainly need to look for those. So bioenergy gives integrated opportunities that address some of the key challenges of agriculture. One of them is surface water quality. This was a study done in the Chesapeake Bay and it said, look, if we take 300,000 uh, additional acres and plant them in corn, we increase five, by five million pounds the nitrogen loading to the bay. If we do it in soybeans, we increase by 2.6. If, uh, if we plant in switchgrass, we reduce by 8.3 million. If we do corn with the existing corn with cover crops, we reduce by 17 million. And if we grew a million acres in switchgrass, we would, we would be really substantially cleaning the bay. Um, in terms of erosion as well, a corn-corn scenario has lots and lots of erosion Corn and wheat gets better. All switchgrass is very, very good with perennials, but corn, wheat, and switchgrass, or, or switchgrass with corn and then wheat, can realize much, much better results. So again, if there's an economic demand for these bioenergy crops, they can be part of the solution uh, to addressing uh, issues within agriculture. Double crops, something I understand you do considerably in this part of the country with winter wheat, but it's not done in many temperate parts of the world. In this case, this is a cool season grass in Triticale. Um, a wonderful study, very recent in the Agronomy Journal by Fairson et al. They looked at, so what's the potential of winter rye if we, if we planted that on corn and soybean land? So they start off with total corn and soy. They subtract land that they believe is too dry. Any, any county that has even a small amount of irrigation, they go, no, let's take that out. They subtract land that's already planting uh, winter crops. So let's look at so it starts off with, um, let's see, with eastern, uh, eastern Arkansas, and then most of that land stays in through these filters uh, near, near the Mississippi River. And so then they apply ryegrass models, and this was done uh, with the, the Agricultural Research Service uh, as a function of local climatic conditions, and they get 110 to 150 million tons on this land, that would give an output if converted to ethanol roughly equal to the current corn ethanol industry from existing managed lands with no substantial competition with food crops, improved water and soil quality, increased farm income and off-season jobs, and finally with existing know-how and equipment. Uh, the big missing factor there is the cost-effective conversion technology for this cellulosic biomass, but the point being that uh, one can imagine scenarios especially ones with perennial grasses involved where multiple benefits are achieved that we cannot achieve now without bioenergy. So let's talk a bit about the role for the consumer. 
Compared to energy efficiency, I realize Diet for a Small Planet was written a long time ago, but in general, I submit that land efficiency has achieved much, much less attention. Look, if you go to buy an appliance, a refrigerator, you get you know, 20 years of Energy Star. If you go to buy a car, right there on the, on the window, you get this sort of thing. I was recently in Brazil. One of my friends had a new washing machine, and this is in Portuguese, so it's not just in the United States. The governments of the world have decided we are going to make consumers aware of energy consumption so they can make informed choices. Well, what happens when you buy food? You get something like this. What you don't get is that. Okay? So, as one way to get an indication of this, there's an analysis I've been working on an embarrassingly long time, but I sincerely hope you will see come out in a prominent journal uh, this year, if not the first half of the year, maybe that's optimistic. We look at, from the point of the consumer point of view, we say, look, as a thought exercise, so what's the impact, what would be the impact of diet change in the United States on how much bioenergy we could produce? So we start with diet assumptions, I'll tell you about those in a minute. You go through what are the implications of how much land would be necessary to feed people under these different assumptions, and then you put an energy crop production model on that and you get a biofuel potential. All of this involves geographically distributed analysis and the like. We have three simple scenarios. The first one is what we eat today. The second one we call protein shift. Hypothetically, have beef consumption and make up the difference with poultry. So a nutritionally uh, equivalent and from a health point of view, superior diet. And the third one, interestingly, is we've assumed that we followed the USDA health recommendations. <laughs> and it's interesting to look at how we spend land. So on the right side, that big thing that's about two-thirds is the land we spend on animal production, with dominated by beef, followed by dairy, and everything else actually very small. And you notice the little green thing over here is the, is the uh, non-animal food. Go over to the left side, the green is now that small bit of land produces most of what we eat, and that tiny little constellation there with beef barely uh, observable is the actual amount of animal uh, food that we consume. And you can go through this for all the scenarios, and I don't have time to talk about the details, but um, you get the idea. And to cut to the chase, and these numbers probably will change, so how much energy you get depends on the dietary scenario, it also depends on the conversion technology and on the feedstock production technology. And so the black is assuming mature process technology uh, the, um, for the processing and the uh, non-shaded uh, rectangles are for current process technology. And then we have on the left side for the different dietary scenarios, we have various um, extents of maturity of the production but that first dotted line is the U.S. gasoline consumption. The second dotted line is global gasoline consumption. So these dietary changes are significant on the scale of providing fuel to the whole world. Okay, and it's just one dietary change in one country. So I actually think that, that when we talk about food versus fuel, or for that matter just feeding people, we really underestimate the, the elasticity of the system. And we underestimate the impact of the consumer piece on this. So, but what about the idea that the world's going to eat more meat, right? As, as people get more wealthy, um, gee, I guess I don't have that one here, but I'll tell you about it. As people get more wealthy, there's this great correlation between GDP and increased meat consumption. So you might say, you know, wait a minute, this may be fine, but in a world that's got, you know, China and India and all sorts of poor people, not they're all poor there by any means, looking to eat more meat, how do you reconcile that? Well, here's the thing. It's not, just like in my opinion, although population is issue, an issue, it's not the main issue. The main issue is resource consumption per capita. That can change by an order of magnitude from a poor person to a rich person. The world's population might increase by 40% before it's projected to level off. Similarly, it's not how much meat you eat. It's the kind of meat you eat. According to our calculations, in the United States today, which is not how it has to always be done, it takes 27 times more land to produce a kilogram of beef than a kilogram of poultry. And in fact, globally, I didn't know this, but globally and in the United States, beef consumption per capita is going down since 1980. 
So actually, in my opinion, the world can eat lots of meat if we want. What we can't do is all eat as much beef as we do in the United States. And uh, that's just how it is if we want to have a world eating higher on the food chain and also make room for bioenergy. Well, speaking of making room for bioenergy, I actually think we need to look beyond that, beyond only can we make room. A common approach in the bioenergy field, I find, is, well, let's assume a bioenergy scenario and then think about what happens to the society and environment. I kind of prefer a different approach. Let's think about where we want to go as a society and an environment and think about if and how bioenergy fits into that. I think that's putting the right priorities there, and I also think that it's a much, much better way to find common ground with people. Because frankly, the communities in the world that, that are sufficiently motivated by bioenergy that all they need to know is you can make room for it is not that big, and it's not getting bigger right now, in my opinion. So in order to maximize value and to appeal to a diversity of interests and sponsors, I think we need to talk about how bioenergy can be part of meeting a larger set of objectives. I've talked about that in terms of agricultural objectives. I want to focus it a little bit on it in a little bit more social context. So think about what happens. And again, we have to approach these things systemically. We can't talk only about uh, you know, one thing that's going to solve it. So think about land efficient food production and consumption to start with, well, that is going to promote food security. It's going to promote preservation of, of uh, habitat and wild places. It's going to promote climate security due to decreased land clearing. And it's going to, other things being equal, make more room for, for bioenergy. And then let's assume that we also have gracefully integrated bioenergy production and, of course, efficient utilization of the energy. Well, that will further contribute to sustainable energy supply. Perennials can improve soil fertility and environmental quality and provide a major new axis of uh, rural economic development. And then there are feedbacks between these because uh, improved soil fertility is going to help food security. It's going to help preservation of habitat. Um, sustainable energy supply is going to help climate security. But as well, the, the major challenge of the urban poor is keeping themselves fed. And the major challenge of the rural poor is the absence of rural economic development. And so we're feeding in positively there. And so there are many, many synergistic interactions that although we can manage them to negative effect, we can also manage to positive effect. And indeed, this is not a bad list of humanity's most pressing needs, actually. Rather, lines up rather well with the Millennium Goals. So I think we need to think about in an expansive way um, how bioenergy, paying attention to the right kinds of land um, and the right priorities can be part of this overall puzzle, given that if we want a low carbon future, we likely have to figure this out. So in closing, I just want to tell you a little bit about a project, and in fact, lit and I mean this, uh, invite you to consider participating. Um, this Global Sustainable Bioenergy Project, we're on the website of an organization called FAPESPI, which is the Sao Paulo Research Foundation. And our objective is to expand understanding of the possibility of beneficially producing bioenergy on a very large scale, on the order of 25% of, of primary energy supply, consistent with recent IEA low carbon scenarios. We have two working hypotheses, and you'll recognize these from what I've said. One, that it is physically possible to make room for bioenergy while honoring other land use priorities. And two, that a systemic approach to food and bioenergy production could positively and synergistically impact multiple urgent human needs. We held continental conventions, which is where I met Chuck. Uh, these weren't that grand affairs. I don't mean to apply that it was UN sanctioned and we had delegates from every county or anything like that, but nevertheless, we announced continental conventions uh, in every continent. We gathered information on framing the project and indeed completely changed our approach. We drafted resolutions and we recruited participants and funds. We are now addressing these working hypotheses unconstrained by current realities for reasons that may be obvious, but I'll elaborate on briefly. And then stage three is to analyze implementation paths and recommend policies. So the idea is, and I mentioned this earlier, this notion that you can't extrapolate a non-sustainable present and expect to get to a sustainable future, no matter how many times we try. And so, by and large, with some notable and, and celebrated exceptions, 
There are many current trends that are not heading in a sustainable direction, and you can extrapolate that future if you wish, and it's worth noting what continuing the current path might do. But you can also develop a future vision with better sustainability metrics. This is what we seek to do in the second stage of the GSB project. And then we can start talking about interpolated futures. Having a distant goal and working back to the present really informs what to do next, when it's often very, very hard to sort that out if one only looks at it in a present context. And then, of course, from that future vision, stage three helps inform what we need to do now. So one of the challenges, and this is my next to last slide, I'm almost done. One of the challenges we faced in this project is that there's already a whole bunch, a whole heaping helping of bioenergy projects out there. And we asked ourselves, and believe me, other people asked us, so what are you trying to do? What value are you trying to add? What need is not already being filled? And this is our answer to that. Very usefully, there's a whole bunch of, pro of energy, bioenergy projects which are focused on most probable futures. They're, you know, it's almost, we can talk about what we think is going to happen, given the way they're happening now. They seek to reflect expert opinion, which is often very sharply divided in this subject, I don't need to tell you. And their point of reference is current reality. Every one of those things is useful, and every one of those things is different from what we're doing. We are unabashedly focusing on most desirable futures. And we seek to inform opinion. If we, if we hold a mirror up to the current chaos, you get chaos, OK? And so we are trying to build new consensus. And our point of reference is not the present. Our point of reference is a future vision that can provide guidance. And again, both are valuable. So we organize the project in terms of geospatial analysis, social analysis, environmental analysis, and integrated scenarios. We look at these at global scales and local scales. Right now, the funding we have for the local scale work is in the Latin American and African countries, funded by Brazil. But I'd like to alert you in closing to a scholar exchange program that thus far, 100% of the applicants have been accepted. Um, it's funded by the Sao Paulo Research Foundation. It supports Brazilian scholars studying abroad. It supports international scholars studying in Brazil. And it can be from several days to a year, or in some cases, more than a year. And this is a vehicle by which uh, the Sao Paulo Research Foundation has tried to, or is trying to, invite the world to participate in this. So thank you for the bearing with me for the whirlwind tour. And um, if you have questions, uh, I don't easily tire of this subject. And I thank you very much for your attention. I know some of you have schedules. You can, you know, feel free to, to slip out. But I do want to uh, open up this floor for questions. I think uh, you can see that um, Professor Lin does like lively. He invites lively discussion. And so um, some of you just feel free to go if you need to go. But uh, the rest of you, um, this is your chance to um, come back on, on, on some of these questions. Great talk. Well, I, 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 I probably don't need it at the time anyways. I, I can, I can, I can hear it. you, and I'm furthest away. Um, <laughs> so what, what I was going to wonder is, is it, what point in the graph that you showed do you think the alarm is, is sounded? Because what, what you're talking about a lot of is behavioral changes and saying, hey, if we make behavioral changes, then we don't need as many technological changes. Um, they've tried to introduce that in the past, putting two people in a car. And if you put two people in a car, you wouldn't need 54 miles to the gallon. And people haven't made that behavioral change, even though it made a good industry of fake people to put next to you so that you can drive in the carpool lanes and, and things like that. Yeah. So, but you have oil companies out there basically literally on a daily basis saying, here's a new field we can get more oil out of. Um, so, so people aren't convinced that we're running out. And so at what point in time do you think that, that we actually have enough convinced to make behavioral changes, or is it just a matter of us as scientists just screaming at people louder? Huh. I'm not sure I have a whole lot better answers than the next person to many of those excellent questions. Um, I'll offer a few perspectives. 
I agree with the implication. I think scarcity is a pretty weak horse to drive us to change. And, and let's look at the recent developments. Um, thank you. Uh, this, this, this is on anyway. So I'm, I'm mic'd. We can use that. Sorry for the abrupt noise. Um, you know, I think climate awareness has gone up and down and is different in different places in the world. Uh, actually, Europe is taking rather, much of Europe is taking rather dramatic measures to address climate. Sweden is targeted having essentially a zero carbon economy by 2030. That's pretty aggressive. Um, so some of the rest of the world, including us, has not done that so much. And so we'll see how that develops as a motivator. I don't have a great crystal ball. But I will say this. I think when considering change, one of the very, very, very early stages in change happening is first imagining that it might. It's an obvious point. But I think there's a bit of a dearth of a collective conf confidence that there is an alternative to what we're doing now that's actually one we might want to live in. And so I think one thing we can do as scientists, in addition to screaming louder, which probably has its limits as an approach, but has its place as well. I think we can also try to illuminate the possible, which is ultimately a technical question, and keep saying, you know, in every chance we get, you know what? We could do things differently. And if we did do things differently, there might be a whole lot of benefits. And some of those changes are technical and some of them are behavioral. But I don't have, I recognize the challenge implicit in what you say. And I regret to say that I don't have it solved for you. <laughs> Along that line, how can I make a change when there's no alternatives available? I mean, the captains of industry only offer me certain vehicles to drive. I can't afford something like the Tesla vehicle. I mean, the consumer can only drive so much when his alternatives are limited. Yeah, that's true. So the question was, when the captains of industry only make certain things available, how can the consumer affect change? I would say quite a lot, frankly. Um, there's a wonderful book I was discussing with, with some people this afternoon. It's, it's not new anymore. It's called A Consumer's Guide to Environmentally Effective Choices. And one of, the, one of the points that book makes is, you know, we can talk about what industry provides, but basically what industry provides is what we consume. It's not like industry produces lots of stuff that just piles up somewhere. And so we can think about our own problems in terms of what industry does to us, but we can equally well, I believe, think about our problems in terms of, of what we ask of industry as consumers. And this book argues, it looks at all sorts of measures of environmental quality. And it argues that there are three human activities that account for about 80% of environmental quality, and everything else is dramatically smaller. And those three human activities are personal transportation, and roughly, that's the biggest one, roughly tied for second are household energy use and what you eat. And you know what? Those are all things we have tremendous control over, over as consumers. It is readily within our ability to have vehicles that get twofold different mileage and have relatively similar prices and relatively similar attributes. It's readily within our ability to have diets that have fourfold smaller footprints. That's actually pretty easy. I'm sure there are people in this room sitting next to each other who have diets that differ by fivefold in terms of, in terms of their, their footprint. And household energy use, that's, that's not a hard thing to impact. So in terms of the things that matter, I actually think consumers have a great deal of leverage aside from also making this a political issue. And I mean, if you believe this is important to the future of the planet, I think we need to ask our elected officials to act that way, and we need to elect officials who will. Uh, there's been some industry push uh, by companies that want to have products close to market for fresh produce. And there's even some venture groups that are now doing vertical farming where they will take old plants and have layers of green crops within uh, the, the old warehouse in vertical columns. What do you think of the future of that as far as reducing um, 
Well, as far as saving, as far as our land usage. Well, I'll bet there are people in this room who know at least as much about that as I do. Um, so I'll just comment superficially, maybe. I mean, I think, first of all, I think it's healthy to experiment. Second, I note the obvious, which is at least in every part of the United States I've visited, uh, my son's a dairy farmer right near Hardwick, Vermont, which the New York Times wrote up as the local vor capital. Um, and so there's a certain consumer sector that 10 years ago used to buy organic and today is much more concerned about local than organic. Uh, I think that's probably uh, a good thing by and large. So I think the kind of initiatives and experimenting you describe are positive, but I would add that, you know, I don't think we have access to very good, I don't think most people have access to very good information about what matters in terms of their consumer behavior, including their dietary, I mean, the food that's produced is the food that we demand and we make choices. And um, I don't think the information is very widely available to make good consumer choices. And so I think there's, there's an educational opportunity there that could be tremendously valuable. I mean, as I mentioned, you know, food labeling doesn't give you the kind of information that energy labeling does. And, and I tried to sort of, I mean, I think the, there are lots of reasons that the world already is eating less beef per capita, but I also tried to emphasize that there's certainly a role for livestock in integrated systems. It's not, in my opinion, particularly important or desirable or meritorious that we sort of say, look, you know, meat's not part of the picture. I think it is part of the picture. I certainly appreciate your efforts and your research and what you're doing. My question would be, are you being funded by Monsanto or ADM? Because I have noticed even at the, our university here, we have problems with uh, chicken manure running off into rivers and so forth. And some people have been denied tenure because they're trying to deal with these things. The uh, general attorney in Oklahoma has been suing us for 10 years and it's getting nowhere that we're doing something about it. So I wonder, uh, this is a political issue too. And uh, since we're into a corporate world now, what can we little people do about this? <laughs> Thank you. Well, the question, am I funded by Monsanto? Uh, no. In fact, uh, for all intents and purposes, I'm a volunteer. I'm not funded at all. Um, the Sao Paulo Research Foundation supports me when I go to Brazil. Um, and I have a bit of discretionary money from the Link Foundation that I use to travel and talk about this sort of thing. But I'm essentially a volunteer at this point. Uh, so if people know, have ideas how to rectify that, we can talk about it. Um, <laughs> I think actually that uh, I think it would be very desirable to have a stronger North American component in this project. And I think it would be logical to involve a land-grant university. But in any case, um, I'm not sure I have an answer to how little people can make a difference beyond the one I already gave, although there is, um, you know, there, there's more that can be done in the political dimension, but I'm not sure it's worth your time to hear me talk about that because I'm not sure I know more about it than any of you do. Lots more questions. Um, I feel like I agree with you with the fact that um, consumers are just unaware of the footprints that they're making and uh, the products that they're buying and what kind of a sustainable impact that has on us. But um, I had a question. Are you promoting that awareness? Like, for example, I know that there are commercials, you know, like for drugs, say no to drugs, so they have commercials about that. I mean, we watch a lot of TV in America and marketers are geniuses for 
basically almost manipulation in, for where our dollar goes. I feel like if there was more funds or more of a movement to get awareness out to consumers, that, that might help make somewhat of a difference in what we purchase. I'm on the relatively early parts of the impact curve here. I may have been introduced as an accomplished person, but um, the fact of the matter is I'm trying to get going the kind of thing you talk about. So in answer to your question, am I doing those sorts of things? No, I'm an unpaid volunteer. <laughs> yeah, I, I think our central goal, well, I mean, our goal is to help uh, rationalize land use and the role that land can play in a transition to a sustainable world and the kind of education you're talking about is definitely consistent with that. Um, we just have to see what the project can grow into. Um, so it's like most of the things I'm involved with, at least the upper side of its future trajectory is a whole heck of a lot uh, more impactful than, than it is yet, but we keep trying. No, you, you, you go ahead and pick them. What countries seem to be leaders in the area of uh, bioenergy? And just by looking at your slides, I'd probably say Brazil is one of them. But uh, more importantly then, are, uh, what countries are leaders, but then what has motivated them in that direction? Is it uh, public policy or what? Well, the U.S. has the biggest bioenergy industry in the world, and I think the main thing that motivated it historically was increasing demand for things farmers know how to grow. Not sustainability, not energy security, not environmental quality, although those, I think th there were people who supported those initiatives in good faith for all of those reasons. But from a political point of view, I think it's been mostly increasing demand for things farmers knew how to grow. In Europe, I think even more clearly that that has been the driving force up until now there's a lot of transition happening right now. Brazil was very simple and very unimodal, and they were sort of single-minded about it. Uh, Brazil, by the way, in my opinion, has by far the, from a sustainability point of view, the most meritorious bioenergy industry in the world right now. And it's almost as big as the United States. It used to be a little bigger, but it's a little smaller just now. Um, Brazil was motivated by the simple fact that they were going to go broke in the 1970s. They, at that time, had no source of oil. They do now. Uh, and ethanol was um, a way for them to move their economy forward. I've also had Brazilians point out to me they had a dictatorship at, at the time, and that sort of simplified uh, the decision-making process. Um, and in fact, I gave a talk somewhat like this one at the University of Georgia last year, and there was a guy there who was very convinced, well, who was very versed in Korean and Chinese uh, high-level political matters, and he said, Lee, you need to go to a country that's got a dictatorship to do your ideas. I'll make introductions for you, but <laughs> anyway. <laughs> uh, did, I, did I answer your question? Okay, thank you. You've got a loud voice anyway, but um, you talk um, admirably about adding uh, various biofuel products into current cropland and pastureland in order to sustainably do mm -hmm. both. But my question is, are you suggesting too, though, to increase all of these yields that we continue with our current policy of pesticides and herbicides and possibly GMO products, which inherently, it seems to me, are not sustainable? Well. In terms of what I personally am suggesting, uh, I believe that we can move in the direction from different departure points, speaking globally, in the direction of this new conservation agriculture that, that I described. And I believe that that will involve more internal recycling um, of resources and less external inputs. Um, I think that personally, that there are uh, there are roles for pesticides and herbicides and GMOs. Um, I I think that you know highly specialized, very large farms are um, 
can probably be, I think we can do the kind of resource integration we need to do more, more easily with a somewhat smaller and somewhat more labor intensive, somewhat more knowledge intensive farm. But I'm, you know, people might, good, well intentioned people might disagree with me, but speaking personally, I don't have really bright lines, uh, and maybe I don't have really bright ideas on this, but let me just offer an example. The, the, the study I mentioned of this integrated crop livestock with zero tillage in Brazil is one of the most inspiring studies I've, uh, or stories really well documented I've ever heard of. And in general, maintaining fertility to grow row crops in tropical countries is really, really tough. And no-till agriculture, of which herbicides are an integral component, no? Possibly not. Possibly not. Well, let's put it this way. The way it's practiced now, the way it's practiced now in Brazil and elsewhere, A, herbicides are an integral component to that management strategy, and B, every environmentalist I know, and I'm good friends with a bunch of them, is not particularly concerned about that and thinks the benefits far outweigh the disadvantages. So just speaking for me personally, I'm not like any herbicide is a bad idea, but there's a spectrum of opinions on such things, obviously. Hi, uh, you mentioned that there were there was a uh, 27 times more land use associated with beef yes. than for chicken, and I guess my first question is that associated with uh, confinement operation for chicken? Um, that and reflects if, how things are done in the United States today, which is almost entirely confined operations for chicken, and as you know, some confined operation for beef. Exactly, for sure, um, and. And I know that kind of the, the current issue, you know, globally right now is, you know, we have, you know, the quantity of like, you know, there are people starving in Africa, and then you have quality people who are concerned with, you know, GMOs, as, you know, she previously mentioned. Um, but, you know, how, how do you address that kind of ethical dialogue with, you know, confinement operation versus, you know, kind of feeding the world, you know, quantity versus quality, I suppose? Well, there's two parts to the confinement business that I understand. One of them is concern for the lives of the animals. Um, so there's that dimension. I confess I don't have any great insight into that. And this, I mean, I note that, um, well, and you know, the other part is, you know, the environmental aspects of it, you know, the antibiotic resistance and all that whole suite of issues. There are credible published studies that, that actually point to, and many people I know are surprised by this, but there are credible published studies that point to that at least some metrics of uh, environmentally, like for example, greenhouse gas emissions, uh, there's credible arguments that they are less from confined feedlot operations than from grazing. Um, I'm, not, I'm not, so I guess what I'm saying is, I mean, I think your question was, how do I look at, well, in particular, confined feeding in terms of reconciling that with other objectives? I don't have a bright line on that one either. I think it's possible that, that although we maybe should redesign confined feeding to some extent, uh, I wouldn't rule out the possibility that a sustainable world ought to have more of it, personally. I mean, maybe I just don't know enough to rule it out. but. You asked me, and that's, I mean, I, I think there's a lot of people in this room who know uh, a lot about agriculture. I respect that, and I'm, I'm standing up here, but that doesn't mean I have better answers than some of you do. I, I think we have to wrap this up pretty soon. We have time for one more question. Okay. With regards to, back to biofuels, rather, in agriculture, and particularly with regards to algae, Yes. You were talking about the possibility of using algae as biofuel to get a lot of energy out of a small area, uh, like high energy output per hectare. Could you use non-engineered algae for that purpose and thereby expand that to being able to, say, harvest algae from some of the hypoxic zones, such as in the Gulf, in the Gulf where algae blooms are causing a lot of problems, to produce energy while also helping stabilize those environments? In principle, yes. 
In practice, I wish I could be more optimistic about it. Um, I will acknowledge that my career has not been actively working on uh, algal biomass production or fuel production from algal biomass. Boy, I sure would hope of myself, though, that I wouldn't stand up in front of people and only say that things were good ideas if I'd worked on them. That said, um, as a way to produce large-scale liquid fuels, I think algae have serious limitations. In my opinion, as a way to rectify uh, where you have a large ratio of inorganic elements to carbon, I think algae may be wonderful. Uh, but I don't think it's going to be driven primarily by energy. And I think the basic problem is, well, there's a number of problems, which maybe we don't need to get into. I could be wrong. There are people who are pessimistic about some of the things I'm optimistic about. So, but, but my opinion is I will be surprised if algae are a large-scale source of liquid fuel. Thanks for introducing uh, Peter Sass. The, uh, we're going to be here for about 10 more minutes, and uh, I'm sure that Professor Lynn would be happy to have you come up and, and to uh, carry on his lively discussion. <laughs> uh, with that, I want to thank you for coming, thank David Edmark for the communications and the microphone work, and also I'd like to thank Professor Lynn one more time. Please.